In the few months I lived in the Dominican Republic, I found a shocking stereotype about US Americans. That is, we love spicy food. The stereotype rings true, as many of the conversations I had with my fellow countrymen living abroad would eventually evolve into our longing for spice. We would frequently exchange information if a certain grocery store had habaneros or jalapenos in stock. Race and regionality did not matter. If you were from the US, you eventually became homesick for spicy foods. Spiciness wasn't as ubiquitous in the North American diet as it is today. If it weren't for our Mexican neighbors, the melting pot of America would be quite mild. This is the story of how Mexican food conquered North America. Before Columbus sailed the ocean blue, food of the old world would be unrecognizable from what it is today. In this new hemisphere, the Spaniards discovered dozens of new and exotic food types that would forever change how Europeans eat. Some notable examples include corn, avocado, blueberries, tomatoes, all peppers within the capsium genus, squash and other cucumbers, vanilla, cacao beans, both regular and sweet potatoes, several other beans, including the poorly named French bean. While these crops were grown throughout the First Nations of the Americas, it was really the Tiano and Aztec Empire's cultivation of these crops that collided with the Spaniards. The Spanish were particularly intrigued by how the Aztecs made a hot drink with cacao beans, a sort of tea that would be unrecognizable from today's hot chocolate. After sampling the original Aztec version of hot chocolate, King Charles V of Spain called it a divine drink, which builds up resistance and fights fatigue. A cup of this precious drink permits a man to walk for a whole day without food. While the Spanish nobility grew quite fond of chocolate and vanilla, they weren't very interested in Aztec's main staple food, the tortilla. The Aztecs only made tortillas with corn, as wheat was a European crop. Even with modern kitchen tools, making tortillas from scratch can be a long and slow process. Part of its preparation time is that the corn needs to go through a process called mise tamalization, which is similar to fermentation. The newly arrived Spaniards would eventually learn to appreciate the tortilla, as they learned that corn was a more productive crop than wheat. The Spanish would also introduce their own foods with the Aztecs, notably the meats of beef, pork, and poultry. Over the centuries, the Spanish and Aztec culinary culture would cross-pollinate to the point where they were no longer distinguishable from each other. A new culinary tradition had been born, the Mexican culinary tradition. For the most part, this new world, old world fusion stayed within its borders until the 19th century. After the annexation of Texas and the US-Mexico War in the mid-1800s, the US seized about half a million square miles of territory from their neighbors. Within this newly ceded Mexican land were, as you may have suspected, Mexicans, whether Californio or Tejano. Most of these Mexican populations were treated poorly by their gringo neighbors. That would start to change in the 1870s. In this decade, San Antonio became a popular tourist destination for US Americans. One gringo writer describes San Antonio as where the life of the 17th century prevails without any taint of modernism. The big draw for tourists was the Mexican quarter of San Antonio, which drew in curious wanderers. The favorite nighttime attraction were the stands that sold chili con carne, better known today as chili. The spice of chili captivated gringo visitors, with one writer describing chili as having various savory compounds, swimming in fiery pepper, which biteth like a serpent. The city planners of San Antonio took notice, and started publishing city guides promoting these chili stands to attract more visitors to Alamo City. Few photos of these chili stands from the 1870s exist, and most of these photos were taken generations later. On the other side of the southwest in San Francisco, another type of Mexican food was growing in popularity, the tamale. San Francisco was chock full of street vendors to accommodate the recent population boom from gold miners, and tamales were king amongst all the food carts. Tamales were so popular that even non-Mexican immigrants began selling them, chiefly among them Chileans, Brazilians, and Arabs. The gringos of the southwest had developed an appreciation for Mexican food, but these spices rarely left the border states. This would change in 1893, when Chicago hosted the World's Fair. Every state in the Union had their own exhibition or pavilion at the fair. Texas and New Mexico introduced chili at their pavilions and it became quite popular. The California exhibition didn't feature tamales, but they didn't need to. 
San Francisco businessman Robert H. Putnam saw the business potential in tamale carts and thought they could be profitable in every U.S. city. What better place to introduce tamale carts than the Chicago World's Fair? With all the cross-country visitors, the fair proved to be an ideal place to introduce tamales to the greater U.S. Gringos fell in love with the tamale carts, and before the fair ended, Putnam had 500 tamale vendors before the fair was over. There was another debut at that fair that unexpectedly increased the popularity of Mexican cuisine, canned food. Canning was a relatively new technology that had been growing in popularity in the U.S., and it was shown off to the 27 million visitors at the World's Fair. The canners noticed the popularity of Texas's chili and California's tamales, and thought, we should can this. The canners did just that, and it was obviously successful since you can still buy canned chili and tamales 130 years after their debut. Naturally, these canned versions brought a tremendous amount of scorn from Southwestern chili con carne Puritans. Charles Ramsdell, a professor from Texas, called canned chili a perversion practice up north, where the Yankee tosspot who lurches from his unsteady couch after a fluid evening and cries out for chili canned corny is resurrected with the bland goo tasting of tomatoes and sugar. While canned tamales became a hit, this didn't deter Putman's prediction that tamale carts would conquer the United States. The only problem for Putman is that there is nothing proprietary about his business model. While he was able to expand tamale carts all the way to New York and Florida, copycats created their own tamale cart business in every city. The tamale man and his tamale cart became so popular across the US that it left a mark on pulp culture of that time. There is a long list of musicians from the 1890s to 1930s who sung their praise for their favorite local tamale man. Everybody loves him, why you'll understand I when you meet Pedro the hot tamale man, Pe -pe -pe Pedro the tamale man. In a way, you could say the tamale man of a hundred years ago paved the way for the food trucks of today. Naturally, the contents of tamales would adapt city by city to accommodate the local palate. Just as naturally, the alteration of tamales annoyed the Southwest Puritans. As one Californian told the Los Angeles Times, None of these effete towns can hope to rival California. We ate some tamales at the World's Fair in Chicago, and they would have made a dog sick. It seemed that in the growth of Mexican food's popularity, a new American tradition was born. Culinary snobbery. Despite cries of inauthenticity, chili and tamales were here to stay. The next Mexican sensation wouldn't arrive in the USA until the 1950s. Hard shell tacos have pretty much existed as long as there have been tortillas. But there is one problem with the tacos of the crunchy variety. They are incredibly difficult and painful to make. They are deep fried tortillas in a U shape, and whoever was cooking them would be guaranteed to get burned. That was until 1947, when Juvencio Maladondo received a patent for his taco frying machine. There is some debate if this was the first taco machine, but it is indisputable that this was the first taco fryer to receive a patent. With this new contraption, Mexican restaurants can now serve crunchy tacos without burning their cooks. Still, tacos didn't really catch on outside of Mexican enclaves. That was until a man named Glenn Bell decided that with some modifications, gringos would go gaga for tacos. Bell was a restaurateur in San Bernardino, the westernmost city on the famed Route 66. San Bernardino was the home of a growing restaurant chain that accommodated car culture, McDonald's. Bell understood that if he could alter the taco and make it friendly to the new American car culture, it would rival McDonald's burgers. He scouted numerous Mexican restaurants between San Bernardino and Los Angeles, and noticed that more and more non-Mexicans were enjoying Mexican food. He floated the idea of opening a Mexican-style McDonald's with his wife. She didn't like the idea, thinking that most white people wouldn't tolerate the spiciness. He said he would tone down the heat, to which she replied, then even Mexicans won't buy it. Nonetheless, Bell moved forward with this plan to make a taco for gringos. To make it more accommodating to the fast-moving car culture, he decided that all the tacos would be pre-fried as opposed to frying to order. In 1951, Bell debuted his tacos at his already existing restaurants named Bell's Burgers. The tacos were initially a flop, 
They were too exotic for most gringos traveling Route 66, and pre-frying taco shells was a sacrilege to the Mexicans of San Bernardino. But on their debut, one brave gringo decided to try one of Bell's tacos. And while ordering, he mispronounced it as a taco. This patron liked it so much that he decided to order another taco. Bell knew that he had something. In time, the taco started to outsell other menu items. In 1954, Bell switched his menu to exclusively sell Mexican food and renamed his restaurants to Taco Tia. While Taco Tia was wildly successful, Bell was a serial entrepreneur who didn't like making compromises with business partners, especially his current business partner, who thought that fast food tacos wouldn't be successful outside of San Bernardino. Bell sold his shares in Taco Tia and moved to Los Angeles. In LA, he would launch and then sell a few different restaurant chains. It wasn't until 1962, in the LA suburb of Downey, that Glenn Bell launched his greatest success and namesake, Taco Bell. Part of Taco Bell's allure is that it capitalized on a growing trend in US restaurants. The themed restaurant. Taco Bells were to look like mini missions with fake adobe exterior and a bell tower. It was a caricature of Mexican Californian culture brought conveniently to a suburb near you. Within two years, Taco Bell started franchising. Within five years, there were a hundred Taco Bells in California. By year seven, two new Taco Bells were opening every week. Other restaurateurs took note, and Taco Kingdom started growing all over the United States. There was Taco Tico in Kansas, Taco Bueno in the Central South, Taco Mayo in Oklahoma City, and Taco John's in the West and Midwest. But Taco Bell's biggest rival was started by a disgruntled employee who founded Casa del Taco, later rebranded as Just Del Taco. In the end, Glenn Bell approved a merger with PepsiCo in 1978 that united his 870 restaurants with the soda giant. Through a series of mergers and acquisitions, Taco Bell became a subsidiary of the giant food corporation named Yum. Yum took the taco well outside of North America, and now you can live moss in Kuwait or Japan. The taco, while well altered to a large degree from its Mexican origins, has gone far, but not nearly as far as the burrito would go. It is disputed if the burrito is actually Mexican. Most culinary researchers agree that it was invented near the US-Mexican border, but on which side? No one really knows. Regardless, burritos were popular in regions near the border, but not really outside of that. Throughout the 1940s and 60s, there was an agreement between the US and Mexico that made immigration easy for farmhands to enter the US. Most of the ranch owners would provide burritos for lunch. They're easy to make in large numbers, are very portable, and can be warmed in the sun when wrapped in foil. However, many of these Mexicans hated the burrito. They were from central Mexico, far from the borderlands. And burritos were as foreign as kielbasa. As far as they were concerned, burritos weren't even Mexican food. Despite their objections, farm managers continued to serve burritos and they became known as the food type of the working class laborer. Its portability made it convenient, but it really wasn't a desired food. That would start to change in San Francisco. Febronio Antiberos, an immigrant from the Mexican state of Durango, opened a grocery store named El Faro in 1961. It was just one block away from a fire station. And a day after opening, a group of firefighters came in asking for sandwiches. With no sandwiches to sell, Antiberos asked the firefighters to come back tomorrow, and he would have something even better for them. When they returned the next day, Antiberos made them burritos fresh to order, a big improvement from the mass-assembled burritos provided to Mexican farmhands. The firefighters were impressed, and would return frequently for these counter-made burritos. But Antiberos wasn't fully satisfied with his success. He made an arrangement with a local tortilla factory to make extra large flour tortillas. By using flour instead of corn, the burritos could be stuffed to the max without tearing or disintegrating. Antiberos had just invented the mission-style burrito. Other Mexican restaurants in San Francisco took note of Antiberos' success and started selling their own version of the mission-style burrito. While Antiberos is largely credited as the inventor of the modern burrito, there is some dispute as to who invented the burrito assembly line. Several restaurants in the Mission District declare that it was their idea, but no one really knows for sure. 
Nonetheless, made-to-order mission burritos never caught on outside of San Francisco's working class. That was until the 1990s. Steve Ells, a graduate from the University of Colorado and the Culinary Institute of America, became a sous chef at the famed Stars Restaurant in San Francisco. Stars was an elegant restaurant that served San Francisco's elite, but on his off days, Ells would explore the Mission District of San Francisco. There he discovered the Mission Burrito and the assembly line that allowed for quick, custom burritos. Ells knew that he could make a business out of this. He moved back to Colorado and opened his own restaurant across the street from the University of Denver and started serving his own mission burritos with an assembly line. The name of that restaurant was Chipotle. Initially, Denverites were confused by Chipotle. Up to that point, most of Colorado's burrito influence came from New Mexico, which meant burritos were supposed to be smothered in chili, preferably Hatch Valley green chili. The first customers of Chipotle were frustrated that their burritos couldn't be smothered and were perplexed by the foil exoskeleton that had to be peeled back while eating. Despite these challenges, the burritos caught on quickly. By the second month of operations, Chipotle was selling over a thousand burritos a day. In 1995, Ells had saved enough cash to open the second Chipotle location, and then a third in 1996. Before the end of the decade, Ells had several Chipotle locations across the Denver area. During Chipotle's growth, Ells noticed the meat quality would fluctuate, and he wanted it to be consistently good. He decided it was time to purchase meat directly from a ranch, as opposed to large wholesalers. While shopping for ranches, he came across a Nyman Ranch partner in Thornton, Iowa. Ells was impressed with the ranch's quality of meat, but he was a bit concerned about the price. He was skeptical if customers would be willing to pay more for higher quality ingredients. He then toured a factory farm and was horrified by what he saw. The Nyman Ranch animals were free to play and roam outside, whereas the factory farm animals lived a life of constant torture. What was originally supposed to be a business trip put Ells at a moral crossroads. He didn't want his success to be tied to the exploitation of factory farm livestock, but persuading his business partners to the more expensive ethical meat would be difficult. It took a year, but Ells was finally able to convince his partners to at least buy pork from Nyman Ranch. To pay for the more expensive free-range pork, Chipotle had to raise the price of their carnitas burrito by $1, an inflection point that made Ells nervous. To his surprise, Customers loved the pork from Nyman Ranch, and sales volume actually increased, despite the price raise. Nyman Ranch's partnership with Chipotle helped launch the consumer conscious movement in the US, much like their partnership with Purdue Farms, who is today's sponsor. Purdue Farms is a family of family farms, which includes Nyman Ranch. They are one of the world's largest distributors of organic meats and have been producing antibiotic-free chicken before it was popular. Whether you want ground beef for your own taco night, fat tire beer bratwurst, or a bundle package for an end of COVID barbecue party, Purdue Farms has a large variety of organic meats to choose from, including treats for your four-legged friend. True to their commitment to sustainable agriculture, a portion of every sale is donated to the Arbor Day Foundation, and their packaging uses green cell foam, which is biodegradable. Best of all, they are offering a 10% discount on regular priced items to viewers of this channel when you use the link in the description. Be sure to use that link in the description to activate this deal. Now, back to Chipotle. After discovering that customers wanted high quality, conscious burritos, Ells restructured his entire supply chain and began working with vendors similar to Nyman Ranch. The change paid off in spades, and in 1998 he was able to attract a major corporate investor, McDonald's. Ells used his investment efficiently and added 500 new stores within the next seven years. By 2006, McDonald's fully divested from all non-brand restaurants, including Chipotle. But this didn't slow down Ells, as he took the company public in 2007. Today, there are about 2,500 Chipotles in five countries. While Ells popularized the Mission Burrito far outside its San Francisco origins, Rodolfo Nerivella would take them even further. But Nerivella isn't a chef or restaurateur. No, he has a doctorate degree in electromagnetic radiation, as you may have guessed, Dr. Nerivella is of exceptional intelligence. 
So much so that he was accepted into NASA's astronaut program. In 1985, he became the first Mexican to go into space. As part of his personal food provisions, Dr. Neri Vela brought with him tortillas. This got the engineers at NASA thinking, making a sandwich in zero gravity can be quite difficult, and would probably require two people to make one. Additionally, the crumbs produced by bread can be problematic in a space vehicle. Instead of harmlessly falling to the ground, breadcrumbs can float around, causing blockages in vents and equipment. Because of bread shortfalls, astronauts were often restricted to eating goop from a bag. But after seeing Dr. Neri Vela enjoying tortillas without causing any problems, NASA decided to investigate the possibility of bringing burritos into space. NASA ended up spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to make their ideal space tortilla. They decided to go with flour tortillas instead of corn because it is more mold resistant. They also added more preservatives and had them packaged in nitrogen sealed containers, giving the space tortillas a one year shelf life. While a technical improvement for space travel, NASA's tortillas aren't as tasty as the ones here on Earth. Because of this, astronauts who serve short missions are expected to leave some of the more flavorful Earth-made tortillas for the long-haul crews. Astronaut Sandra Magnus praises the tortilla for being a basic food group here in space. You can do so much with the tortilla. It becomes the vehicle with which to eat almost anything. I cannot think of anything that cannot be put on a tortilla or has not yet been put on a tortilla. Consequently, one of the main goals of any crew is to make sure that enough tortillas get on board. 35 years after Dr. Neri Vela's mission, the tortilla is still the preferred food of space travelers. And that's how Mexican food conquered North America. A big spicy thank you to Purdue Farms for sponsoring this video and to all of this channel's patrons, including VIP patrons Marnie and Steven. And while not involved with this video, I would also like to thank Gustavo Ariano. Without his research, this video wouldn't have been possible.